how do I become a Christian? Or how can I be sure I'm truly a Christian? This video has the answer, so stay tuned. Hello everyone, my name is William Zolu Agbemi, the young man whom Jesus loves and a faithful witness for Christ. I welcome you to Grace Tidings Missions, the platform for evangelism, discipleship, and Bible studies. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, now would be a good time to do that. And don't forget to hit the notification button so you won't miss anything. I bring to you today a very important message that I titled, How to Become a Christian. You know, there are many people in the world today who believe they are Christians, but, but they really need to be sure they are Christians. And there are others who have no idea how to become Christians. So this video is going to address their problems. If you're interested in reading or learning more about this topic, there's an article available right now on my website. So when you're done watching this video, you can go take a look at it. This video is designed to show the world how to become part of the body of Christ. After watching this video, you're going to be able to tell within yourself whether you are a true Christian or just simply religious. This video answers the question, how do I become a Christian? But before you can know how to become a Christian, you need to first understand who is a Christian or what, it, what does it mean to be a Christian. Many people in the world today, including some preachers, have come up with different definitions for what it means to be a Christian. To some people, uh, they think they are Christians because they practice holiness. To others, they think they are Christians because they joined a local church or even got actively involved. And there are others who think they are Christians because they were born in Christian families. And to some, it was when they had serious problems and, and they ran to a church and the church supposedly solved their problems. And then as a result of that, they joined the church. That's how they became Christians. You know, there are some churches today who claim that they, they can minister deliverance to people. I've seen it done many times. You can be a part of such programs for three days or even more and not one time will anybody preach the gospel to you. You can't get saved without hearing the gospel. So such, such activities are just nothing but ministration to the flesh. There's no how you can become a Christian by going through a, a ritual like that. And there are some people who think they are Christians because of the way they dress or the way they speak or whether they eat breakfast or Sunday or not. Somebody told me he's a Christian because he's keeping the Ten Commandments. You know, even though some of those things are good for Christians to do, but none of them can make you a Christian. So a Christian is not somebody who have achieved or gone through any of those things that are listed. And a religious person is not necessarily a Christian. Salvation is what makes a person a Christian. But salvation begins by knowing the reason why we need to be saved in the first place. So why do we need salvation in the first place? The Bible says all have sinned. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. And our sins make us enemies of God and put us under the wrath of God. Because the Bible says those that are unsaved, they are, they are children of wrath. So the wrath of God is upon them, according to the word of Jesus himself. So this is bad news to those who are not saved. But, but it gets even worse because you cannot save yourself. There is nothing you can do or there is nothing you can offer to save yourself from the penalty of sins. So in a nutshell, salvation is having your sins forgiven. To be saved means that you've been saved from the penalty of your sins. And by the way, the penalty is hell or the lake of fire. Since salvation has to happen outside of the sinner, which means it has to happen outside of the effort of the sinners, Jesus Christ is the only one who qualifies to atone for the sins of the world. Therefore, a Christian is somebody who has fully trusted in Christ's completed work as the only solution to the problem of his or her sin. That's a Christian. So that is a person uh, who has received the gift of salvation through faith in the completed work of Jesus Christ. The person has been forgiven, is justified, is redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he has become a child of God and a new creature. So he's got the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, he's blessed, he's complete, he's glorified in Christ, and he is in his body. 
and he has eternal life and he's always saved. That is a description of a Christian according to the Bible. But all this happened to us without we are saved simply because we put our trust in Christ. We trust in his completed work, not by anything we do or by anything we can offer, but by simply believing what he did on our behalf. And this truth is written all over the New Testament. You begin from the Gospel of John. John chapter 1 tells us in verse 12 that as many as received him, to, to them gave he power to become sons of God. That's children of God. Even to them that believe on his name. And verse 13 says, Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's what it means to be a Christian. That you've been born from above. That's something completely outside of you. You can't contribute anything to that. So the point is, you are, not a, you are not a Christian until you have believed. You could be as religious as you possibly can. Nobody is considered part of the church until they have believed. Now you hear me saying, believe, believe, believe. You just don't believe anything. You don't believe just anything. You believe a specific message that the Bible has given. And the Bible calls this the gospel. Remember, I'm not talking about how to live a Christian life here. I'm, I'm still talking about how to become a Christian. So I want you to follow me very, very carefully. So this is what you must believe, that you have sinned. The Bible says all have sinned. So that's in, that includes you and I. And we cannot do anything to save ourselves. I couldn't do anything to save myself. And you can't do anything to save yourself from the penalty of sin. So only Jesus can rescue us. Only Jesus can save us from the penalty of our sins. In Acts chapter 4 verse 12, we read that neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So the way to receive salvation is through Christ. You have to abandon your own righteousness. You have to abandon your own holiness and run to the cross. So believe in the gospel of salvation. The gospel is very simple. It tells us what Jesus did because of our sins and what he did on our behalf and how we should respond. Now, among many passages in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 tells us the gospel. It says, For Christ also had once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And you can read similar message in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from verse 1 through 4. The message of the gospel is very clear. It's very simple that we have sinned and there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. And that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that is the simple message that we have to believe. So nothing that we are required to do. All that is needed on our part is to just trust in Christ. Believe that Jesus did all that for our sins. That is the gospel. So if you have not believed, you can't be saved. And if you are not saved, then you are not a Christian. God started putting people in the body of Christ from an event at Pentecost. It was recorded in the book of Acts. So on the day of Pentecost, the people listened to the message of the apostles. The message was delivered in a, in a rather miraculous way. The apostles spoke in diverse tongues. And that means different languages. And, and the people that were listening, they had the language in their different languages, in their various languages. And what's even more amazing uh, about the miracle of tongues is the message that they were given by the tongues. Uh, the people that like to run to Acts chapter 2, if they feel like speaking in tongues, they don't tell people about this. There was a message that these people were giving, and the people that were listening to them had what they were saying. They were not just speaking gibberish. So the, the people were wondering, what's going on? Are these people drunk? And Peter said, no, these, these are not drunk. And he told them what it was. He gave them a very passionate message. I'm going to share some of them with you. In Acts chapter 2 from verse 22, if you're going to get the, the whole gist, I want you to read from verses 22, maybe to verse 36. I don't know if I'm going to be able to read everything, but listen to some of the things that Peter says to them on that day. It says, ye men of Israel, and listen to me, this message was specific. It was needful for the Jews to hear on that day. This is not the message that we preach today, but listen to how it is very unique to the Jews. It says, ye men of Israel, 
Hear this word. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. Peter is still preaching. He says, which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. So you witness them. It says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Verse 24, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. I'm going to jump to verse 36. And it says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God had made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. <laughs> That's a very powerful message of the gospel that there's nothing that the Jews needed on that day more than this one. So the people had the message. It's a very powerful message of the gospel. And they were touched, so touched that they, they didn't have any choice than to repent. Listen to what it said in verse 37 of Acts 2. Now when they had this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, These are the Jews that were contrary to Christ before, but the message of the gospel made them at a spot that they couldn't but to repent. They said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? This guy has said everything he said. He was right. There's no way we can deny all this. So we've killed our Messiah. So what are we going to do now? Peter continuing, he tells them what to do. In verse 38, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 39, it says, For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. Verse 40, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untowards generation. So Peter said a lot of things to them on that day. Uh, some of them were not recorded in this chapter according, according to what you can see there. So the, the message was a powerful message. They believed. But like I said, don't forget, we do not preach this gospel of Acts chapter 2 of verse 38 and 40 today because this was the message that was unique to the Jews. They needed this at that time. There were transitions that took place after the Pentecost. Things changed. When the, when the gospel went to the Gentiles, the message changes. So all we need to do now is believe that Jesus has died for our sins and he was buried and that he rose again the third day. That's what it takes to be saved today. So the Jews at Pentecost believed. 3,000 of them. Verse 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. In the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So this was how God started bringing people into the body of Christ. They hear the message, they believe, they are saved. And this is how he still does it today. It hasn't changed. You have to believe. And Christ in his own words made this very clear in John chapter 5 verse 24. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. So you have to believe. All it takes is to believe. Now, subsequent to Pentecost, the accounts of conversion recorded in the Bible follows the same pattern. People have to hear the gospel and they have to believe. Let me read some verses to you still in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4 verse 4. The Bible says, How be it many of them which had the word believed. And the number of the men were about 5,000. So uh, at Pentecost, 3,000 people believed. And a few days after that, Peter preached again. And the Bible says 5,000 souls, 5,000 men were saved. I want to say there will be more than 5,000 because if they only counted men to be 5,000. But listen to what it says. It says, they heard the word and they believed. You know, similar message in Acts chapter 5 verse 14. The Bible says, and believers, the key word is believers, were the more added to the Lord, multitude of both men and women. You have to believe before you can be saved. It's after you are saved that you now become part of the body of Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. In Acts chapter 10, 
Peter was sent to a, a Gentile's house. That is the first time the gospel will be preached to a Gentile. His name is Cornelius and his household. So Peter went to preach to them. And the Bible says in Acts 10.44, it says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which had the word. They didn't just hear it, but they believed. But immediately they believed, the Spirit fell on them. That is a sign that they've been saved. That is a sign that they've been born again. When Paul was preaching in Acts chapter 13, in verse 38, Paul says, Be it known unto you, men and brethren. Now he's addressing the Jew in this place also. He says that through this man is preached unto you. This man is Jesus Christ. He says through him is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. In verse 39 it says, And by him all that believe are justified from all things which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. All that believe are justified from all things. You have to believe before you can be saved. And you have to believe a specific message. And that message is the gospel. There is no other way. There is no shortcut. You can't pay your way to salvation. You can't walk your way to heaven. It's not possible. You can't even pray your way to heaven. It's not possible. There's a similar idea in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted. The word trusted here means to, to, to have faith in something. Trusted. You can replace that by faith. So you have faith in something. But in this, in this case, it's in somebody. And that's Christ. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye had the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That is a message that you need to hear before you can be saved. And it says, in whom after ye believed. Did you see that? In whom after ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Again, the Holy Spirit is a sign of conversion. Essentially, the Bible calls the earnest of our inheritance. So, it's one of the signs, one of the proof that you are saved because you have the Holy Spirit when you believed. Apostle John writes in his epistle, 1 John chapter 5, in verse 13, it says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. So, this is not about being religious. This is not about being a part of a church. This is not about giving our friend or sponsoring missionaries or all those things, even though some of those things are good. It's a good work of Christian. But this is about believing because this is what makes you a Christian. This is what gets you saved. It says, These things have I written to unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know. A lot of people don't believe it. They don't even know. They don't have the assurance of salvation. It says that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. <laughs> you, see, you, see the, you see the phrase, believe on the name of the Son of God happen twice in one verse. So, so the point is, you have to believe. If you don't believe, you are not a Christian. And like I said, you just don't believe any message. You believe the message of the gospel. Now, if you are still convinced at this point that you are saved, if you believe that you've trusted in Christ and you are saved and you are sure, then I'm not going to argue with you. But if not, maybe you are not sure you are saved or you are not even sure how to get saved. All it takes is to believe. Accept who you are. A sinner who cannot save himself or herself and believe the gospel. It's very simple because salvation is not by works. It's not by anything we can offer. It is wholly by faith in Christ alone. The Bible says when we believe and put our faith in Christ, in his completed work, that we are saved, our sins are forgiven. And one of the things that happens is that you get the Holy Spirit at the moment when you believe. I know a lot of people don't believe in that, but they can believe whatever they want because the Bible is very clear that every Christian receives the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. You can't even get saved. You, the regeneration cannot take place without the work of the Holy Spirit. So how can you be saved? And not have the Holy Spirit. But that's a discussion of another day. But suffice it to say that when you get saved, part of what happened to you is that you receive the Holy Spirit into you. He comes into you. That is Christ in you. Now, finally, as a word of encouragement to those who are saved, to the Christians, you need to realize 
or keep in mind their sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. It is a process by which the Holy Spirit conforms the believer to the image of Christ. And this is not achieved or accomplished by the believer's performance. The believer is only supposed to yield and submit him or herself to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the authority of the scripture in his or her life. That is how to live the Christian life. Now, here is the question of the day for the Christian. How did you become a Christian? What did you have to do to become a Christian? Do you remember the message that you listened to on that day? You can leave a comment below in the comment section. Like I said already, if you're interested in learning or reading more about this topic, how to become a Christian, there's an article available right now on my website. You can take a look at that. If you've been blessed by any part of this video, remember to hit the like button and don't forget to share with anybody any way you want there are a lot of people who need to know how to become a christian and this video will be a blessing to them and don't forget to regularly visit our website gracetidings.org take a look at the blog there are a lot of life-changing materials like this that can be a blessing to you thank you very much for watching until next time grace and peace be with you in jesus name amen